Now we're going to reinstall our front roller. And there's a couple of points that I like to see greased on these. This makes them work a little smoother. This is a minor point that's a bit of a uh, bit of apple polishing really, but uh, I like to put a little bit of grease on the screw. Just a dab and then start it back in, work it back and forth. And I like to put a thin film onto the actual rack. Um, just sort of kind of moves back and forth freely. And we're also going to put a little bit on the spring itself. The spring goes in first. And this goes in second. And it just helps to make sure everything moves in back and back and forth. The spring on these is very, very tight, so it should be a fair bit of resistance. Our next step is to reinstall our release mechanism. This is what actually uh, takes the tension off of the spring and pulls the roller back to allow you to change belts. I also greased this. doesn't take much. But, uh, when you reinstall this, this boss here should be in to the upper left hand corner and you want this rolled all the way over here. And sometimes it takes a little bit of effort to get everything lined up, but there shouldn't be much tension when you're reinstalling it. So I'm going to put our screws back in here. up and install my second one. Our next step is we're going to reinstall our front roller. And what you do, you move your release lever back. Now, on these rollers, it's important to remember which way is which. The deeper section here goes towards the arm. The shallower part will be out towards the uh, towards the camera. So first, you put your omnipresent bronze washer on there. I don't want to lose that. And what I do with these is I squirt grease into here. And you, what you do is you put your finger over the other hole. And if everything goes right, when you put it in place, since the grease can't escape, put your fingers in the way. It forces the grease into the space between the uh, two sets of needle bearings that support this. Which, the needle bearings on these I have replaced, but honestly it's the rare sander that requires those to be replaced. They usually just need grease and they're fine again. You put your outside washer on here, and then your lock nut. And your lock nut will determine how tight this is. You want this roller snug so that it can't shift from side to side right now. But not so snug that it puts an additional load on the sander to operate that. So I'm going to do that by feel really. Feels pretty good. We're finished up front. Um, one step uh, that you can do here, especially if you're worried about this roller arm being out of true with the base plate, would be to set this on the surface that you know is flat. Um, the surface plate works wonders if you have access to one. And make sure that the sander does not rock. And we've tested this one out. I don't believe this sander has ever dropped, which is something of a rarity. 
So our next step is to install our shoe. The original shoe for the sanders was actually a, uh, made up of a few different components. There's the actual spring steel plating and then the cork backing. But when you buy a new one, the cork is actually glued in place, which is in a lot of ways something of an improvement, uh, mainly in that um, I've occasionally seen the cork broken off uh, on the older shoes where you had to replace it just due to damage before the shoe ever wore out. Now, your new shoe will come with new screws. It will be Phillips screws. But uh, they're a little on the stumpy side. There's not a whole lot to them. And the older slotted head screws, uh, besides being larger and having more surface area, uh, also are appropriate for machine of this era. So if you're a stickler for little things like that, and I'll admit that I am, you'll want to uh, reuse your original screws because they're better and they don't look out of place. So we're going to go ahead and it'll be started and this is definitely a straight place where you're going to want to start all your screws before you go any further because these almost never all fit on the first try. It takes a little bit of uh, jockeying components around to get everything lined up nice. And what you want is for the plating to be not high or low but lined up parallel with the casting. So once you've got it at that point, you can start snugging everything up. And now, to keep everything out of trouble, we're going to install a sanding belt. And I have seen it done where a sander without a belt on it gets hung up by the plate and the plane gets damaged. It is spring steel. It will bend back, but not if you bend it really far. So that's just one more thing to watch out for. So there's that. We're now ready to install our brushes. And one thing to be made aware of on older units like this, with a lot of wear and tear, it's possible for this brush housing to become loose and for it to rotate out of position. There are, on older tools, inevitably two set screws that hold the two brush housings in place. And what can happen is the set screw can be backed off and vibrate loose, and it'll allow the housing to both rotate and move in and out. And this has been known to cause problems. So it's always a good idea to check those, make sure that they're not loose. I don't know if you can hear that click, but that one shifted slightly. So we're going to go ahead and tighten that up. Another thing to watch out for is that the line formed by the corners of the brush housing should be exactly parallel to the commentator bars themselves. If this is rotated either direction, this is going to cause erratic brush wear, it's going to shorten brush life, and it can potentially cause the motor to wind up overheating in the future. It's a small detail, but it's something if you're planning on putting a lot of mileage on a tool, it's cheap insurance just to double check that. We're now going to install our brushes, and one thing that I recommend doing is taking a pair of pliers, and you're going to put a small bend in the outside perimeter of the, the uh, brush, and what this is doing is it's just making sure that when the cap is screwed all the way down, it holds this firmly and makes good contact against the brass brush holder. So I'm going to install a brush here. Now, in installing the switch, the only real thing you have to watch out for is, of course, not to leave any bared wiring or anything like that, but to leave just enough lead on the cord itself that when it's installed, there's not access taking up room in the handle because there's very low access space in the handle, but there's enough that there's some strain on the brushes. So we're going to go ahead and get all this work into place. And there's a small screw 
that holds the brush or holds the uh, switch in place. And install that. I'm going to route our wires between the two field wires. Put our strain relief in place. Make sure everything's tucked neatly in place. And we'll be ready to put our handle half on. Now the handle half is going to clamp this cord down. It's important to make sure that none of the cordage is sticking out anywhere, that there's no exposed wires, anything that's liable to get pinched, because you can actually cut through the insulation on the wire, and it's a big no-no. So we're going to tighten down our screws to the sanders boss. And now we are ready to fire up the sander. Now what we're going to be listening for is growling, clacking, any noise that doesn't sound like it should be there. Um, so we're going to fire it up once. It sounds good. It comes in a nice, uh, nice smooth stop, no clunking, no scraping. Now one thing to watch for is the sparks you'll see around the brushes when you fire this up. Some random sparks coming off of where the brushes meet the commentary bars is to be expected. Um, and some of that will go away with time as these are brand new brushes and they'll need uh, some time to seat properly. But one thing you want to watch for is when you see the arcing wrap around a quarter of the commutator bar, that's a sign that the, the commutator, the commutators are damaged and the armature is burned up. But, you know, here we have a clean bill of health and we do that again. <laughs> So our last step, we're going to put our belt back on. Now, when you run these machines, you of course have to put oil in them. And in the 60s, the paperwork for the 503 said that you filled it to the sideline. I've never seen a 503 with a sideline in the, the side glass. So what I do is when it's sitting straight, which should fill up about halfway. A little bit over that's not going to harm anything. You definitely don't want to fill it up to the top because it'll actually force oil through the seals under pressure and it'll get oil all over your armature and it can cause motor problems uh, as well as making a mess. So for our last step, we're going to track our belt. We're just going to turn the sander upside down and we're going to... And that tracks beautifully. So this sander here is ready to go.